Well, good morning, Dave. Um, good afternoon, Rob. Good to see you both. The annual accounts for the year ended 30th June will be going out to shareholders today, um, ahead of the 117th AFC AGM next month. Uh, so I thought there's a good opportunity to give all our fans an update on finances. Dave, if I can start with you, please. Um, the club has a very clear strategy, but what effect has COVID had on last year? Yeah, well, it's good to, to see you, Mal, um, as well. Um, so the reality is, is that um, we have a number of pillars to our strategy at, at the highest level. Um, clearly, it's for us to uh, make the investments necessary in our football operation uh, to achieve our aspirations of, you know, being higher end of the league each season, higher end of the cups, hopefully winning a cup or two, and then um, getting to Europe. Um, last season, we deliberately planned for an additional investment to get ahead of some of the squad changes. So the squad that you see today is really as a result of last season's efforts. Um, and also investment in the fan engagement programs, which if we weren't in COVID, uh, we would be enjoying today. So the net net is we had planned for about a two million pounds loss last financial year. That ended up being 2.9 million as a result of COVID because obviously COVID only affected the last two or three months of, um, of, of last uh, financial year. But what that has meant is that our wages to turnover ratio versus the prior year, which is a key indicator, went up from 58 to 68% um, last season. Um, what I would say is this, um, is that um, the strategy is a clear strategy. We've clearly seen this season um, us adopting a, a, a more offensive style of play and a thing style of play because we've got the players to do it. And again, that was a key part of what we wanted to um, put um, in place. But I will say this, Mal, up front is that um, we've come together, all of us involved in the club. It's not about one individual group or constituency. It's about and uh, those of us that are invested in the club and those of us day to day running the club, it's about our fan base, it's about our community and everything that we have done together has really helped us get to the position we are today uh, as a club. Okay, Dave, so that was last year's figures. Um, it's clear with fans continuing to be locked out of the game and um, will have a, a massive impact on projections for the current financial year. So can you just tell us where are we right now? Yeah, and so obviously this has been something that all the clubs in Scotland, as we talk to each other, have had to project and re-project. Obviously, the, the last statement we gave for this current financial year was that we would hopefully have fans back or full crowds back in January, which clearly isn't going to be the case. So our latest projections that we've announced are really based upon limited or no crowds for the whole season. And, um, and, and, and that projection shows that the club will lose five million pounds this year. And it's all due to a collapse of income because of uh, COVID or match day income is down uh, 82% um, for the reasons that we have shared um, publicly uh, recently. Our wages to turnover ratio this year with no crowds at the games is going to be 90%. Now, all of that said, every club is going through this, Mal. Every club is challenged by this. We are a very, very well-run club. What we've gone through in the last few months has been um, nothing short of remarkable in the sense that today, even after spending 14 million on Cormac Park, after investing more in our first team operations, that we are still debt-free. The biggest challenge that we kind of face in reality is, is that where do we go from here? How, do, how can we give hope to fans coming back to full stadiums for next season? And so, um, so that's really the, where, where the kind of rub is. But the fact that we're at 90% wages to turnover ratio due to just a collapse in income is, um, is obviously a, a, not just a challenge for Aberdeen, but for all Scottish clubs, because we don't have the TV income that England has. I mean, 40, 50 percent of clubs revenues on average in Scotland come from um, gate receipts. Rob, if I can come to you now, please. Um, we obviously hope to have people back in the stadiums or at least partial crowds back at the Tordrebin now. 
So you maybe just tell us a wee bit more about the implications of not having fans at home games. Sure, Mel. Well, you know, obviously Dave's already mentioned how our match day income has been so severely hit. We're, we're, we're 82% down. And that's really as a result of obviously no, no walk-ups, no, there's no away fans. We, we can't sell hospitality. Those facilities have, have been lying dormant for months now. Um, and our traditional match day sponsorship um, inventory, which, you know, generally um, generates some, some important and significant revenue for us, you know, we, we can't put to use. So, we're left really with some very limited opportunities around how we generate match day income. We've got to rely to some extent on, on pay-per-view. We've converted that match day inventory into, into virtual sponsorships. And that's certainly um, you know, gained some traction, but you, you're talking a, a certainly a fraction of the cost that you might if you were um, carrying that out with, with fans in the stadium. And we've turned our half-time draw into something online as well. So you know, fans would have seen last week the graphic that we published, and that showed the, the really significant delta between, you know, what we're getting in uh, currently versus what we would get in, in a, a, from a traditional um, or, or a normal season. So, you know, you look at pay-per-view income, we're averaging probably 16, 17,000 pounds per, per match from that, but it's significantly, significantly lower than we would um, ordinarily be be earning under under normal circumstances. And when you add to that challenge the costs of having to put on the games, still with you know a, a range of protocols in place, there might not be fans in the stadium, but there are a whole series of protocols that we've got to meet um, to stage the game safely. The additional investment that we've put into the likes of, of Red TV to help to continue to deliver value for season ticket holders, it's quite a potent mix of you know high cost. Um, and, and, and limited opportunities around income. And Rob, I think that the real frustration is that we obviously had a very successful trial with Kilmarnock game, which seems an awful long time ago now, and it's just the fact we haven't been able to move things forward at all. Uh, ab absolutely, Mel. You know, we, we, we have really robust protocols. Our, our recent survey that we carried out showed that fans, are they, they feel safe, they want to return to, to, to Pataudry. They're confident in the measures that we've taken as a club um, and they want to come back to seeing football. And the environment that we would create and that we created during that very successful trial is a controlled environment. It's very different to a bit of a free-for-all, really, at a shopping centre, for example. So we, we really, you know, we're, we're not asking for carte blanche here. We are saying we want dialogue and we want a plan and we want to see some sort of clear measures because otherwise we're going to be heading into next season and we'll talk about that later i'm sure in the interview but we're going to be dealing with a whole new set of challenges as we as we get into next season yeah. Dave, i'll come back to you if you just talk us through the sort of top line figures um and what's been done to close the funding gap yeah well obviously there's the financial results but there's also cash flow you know and um we have the saying at the club that cash is king um, and um, the last announcement we made, Mal, was that we we were still 3.8 million short in the 10 million hole that was started. And um, and so just to give an update on that, um, we managed to, some of our friends in the States as investors just recently put another 1.1 million into the club. We had the sale of Scott McKenna. Um, significant chunk of that was up front, but it still gets paid over couple of years depending on some of the um, some of the conditions associated with that um, but to counter that we now have another three to three plus million of no income or lack of income from January for the rest of the season so in essence we're back at square one which is we still have about a 3.8 million to 4 million cash gap um, that we need to um, that we need to deal with uh, by um, by next summer, um, and, um, and 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 so that's kind of where we are. Um, we are working feverishly to to close the gap, um, and to be able to make sure we continue to do the things that we need to do. Because the last thing we want to be doing is divesting or pulling back our, on our investment, ideally in our football operation, because we've got three million two to three million of real income that we get based on prize money each season. So for example, if we took a million or a million and a half out the football operation budget, we could lose two to three million in prize money. That's kind of the dilemma that we face. 
But look, we're exceptionally well run. We're still debt free as we stand. And um, everyone, particularly the fans as well, are, are playing their part to, uh, to get the, the gap closed. Rob, you just go back. I mean, you touched on it slightly, but you know what's going to happen in the summer? What, what's it, the, the impact next season? What's the concerns there? Mel, look, the, you know, the, the reality for us and, and for, for clubs across the country, um, you know, if we're to go into next season with limited or, or, or no fans at games, I think it's going to be impossible to survive without you know, having to look at some sort of significant restructuring right across the club. You know, if you look back over the last eight months, fans have been absolutely amazing, whether that's with season ticket purchases for a, for a season that they didn't know, you know when it might start, and it, and, it, and it effectively hasn't really for them in, in terms of being able to attend the, 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 the stadium. DNA sales, you know, significantly up, um, up to nearly 6,500 now. But it is really hard, I think, for us to see how 8,000 season ticket holders will will buy again if there's no guarantee of, of seeing live games. And I think, you know, the, the knock-on effect of, of not returning with full crowds potentially could be catastrophic. And, and you know, we're not trying to scaremonger here. That, 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 that's an honest statement. You know, we, we would have to look at scaling back our operations in, in, a, in a variety of different ways. It might include the potential of redundancies. And we set out on this journey eight months ago with a clear view of trying to make sure that we could preserve every job at the club um, and the trust. But the reality is we've got a huge supply chain that feeds into the club and depends on our match day operations. That's going to be at risk as well. And I think there's, there is genuinely a serious risk to the club and to the community trust and all of the really good work that they do. If I could just add to that, um, uh, Mal, you know, the reality is, is that um, hundreds of people in football clubs have been made redundant in the last few months, okay? And um, because of, of how we run our club and we, we need everybody that is there, we've managed to retain everybody um, at the club and we've been thankful to everyone at the club, all the staff on the field, off the field for the uh, deferrals that they agreed to and wage cuts because it's managed to help us keep everybody and also to, to, to fully pay the lower um, or, or the lesser paid people, shall we say, who are at the club. But here's what I'm hearing in football. If there's no plan that we can look at um, with respect to return to fans, even if it's through to, to beginning of next season fully back, if there's no plan, then the way clubs will deal with this, not just Aberdeen looking at it, is, is that they'll do everything they can to keep the investment in the first team. And, and, and another reason for doing that as well is, is that everyone associated with the first team, they're all on contracts, some of them for two, three, four years. It's not something you can just throw out the window at all. But what clubs will do is keep their investment to be competitive in the first team, which basically means that everything else that goes on at the club, whether it be youth development, you know, whether it be with the community trust stuff programs that we support as well, all of these, all these are things um, that, that, that would have to be looked at. And these are critical for us as a club. We want to be at the heart of our community. We are at the heart of our community with what we've been through in the last few months. And we will do our darndest to get through this, to keep everyone employed. But we can't do it on our own, Mal. We have to have the Scottish government come to football and, and get a clear plan agreed versus this pillar to post week to week not knowing what the rules are and and that's our uh, that's our kind of push robinized push within scottish football is to try and get that clarity there because we've demonstrated that we are a highly regulated environment you compare coming to petodri right we know who's coming when they're coming how they get in the testing versus people coming into the city centre of any city, including Aberdeen. You don't know when they're coming, right? who's coming, and um, that's unregulated versus what we have as a regulated environment. Of course, we need to be down in tier one, and Aberdeen's virtually there. So the net net is this, is Scottish football needs help. We're not looking for a handout. We're looking for a plan. You've just done that, and you touched on it a little bit before, but I think it's a key point. I mean, you're obviously painting quite a bleak picture, but people will look at this and say, well, you know, the club are still making investments on and off the field. 
Um, so people might be asking, why are we do? Why, how are we able to do that in the current climate? You know, we've made some fantastic signings this year as well. So, you know, the government, others looking at that think, well, clubs are still spending money, but we'll be explaining a wee bit about that. Well, that's a, it's a great question, and I've seen it in the media as well, people talking about clubs. Well, listen, you're, you're saying you don't have money, but you're buying players, etc. Well, first of all, we've had, as you know, Mal, and Rob knows, we've had town halls with all of our staff around our strategy, right? And, and our strategy, and this is the dilemma, is that we've got significant investment in our first team squad, right? And if we don't invest in that and don't stay competitive, we could lose two to three million a year of prize money, right? We don't budget to be 12th in the league with no prize money. We budget to be third in the league each year as a minimum. We budget to be at the latter stages of the Cups and qualify for Europe every season. That's two to three million of prize money. Now, as I said earlier, if we take a million or a million and a half out of that, we could be robbing Peter to pay Paul because we lose two and a half to three million in prize money. That's the dilemma. And so um, we've made that decision there. And obviously this season, we, we obviously we, 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 we achieved Europe, right? It would have been nice to have gone further, but we got Sporting Lisbon. Um, and, um, and, and similarly, we started off really well in the league. So uh, that's the dilemma that's there. Uh, things like our fan engagement, what we've done is, is that we've looked, Mal, Rob and I have looked really carefully at every project we've undertaken. And we've cut back on a whole number of projects to focus on the things that matter. Fan engagement, the Aberdeen initiative with the free under 12 Aberdeen initiative. So we're part of our community. And the other thing is, is that you know, the call center we put together earlier this year, we're gonna bring the band back again. We're in the middle of doing that right now where we will have those nurturing calls going from the club out to the thousands of people because Christmas is coming, winter's here and it's pretty dark. And so we wanna just be at the heart of our community uh, as well. And so that, that's the rationale behind why we're still investing in the first emails, because we budget, we've got high goals on our expectations for prize money. Rob, Dave mentioned the community there. Um, you're a trustee of the AFC Community Trust. Um, how has the trust been affected and, and what are the potential consequences if we have to review their activities? Well, you know, obviously, Mel, at the start of the lockdown, a number of the, the, the trust activities were, were put on ice and, and, and couldn't be carried out. And there have been a number of instances where, you know, for example, they'd, they'd want to raise money at, at, at matches and with no crowds there, they've not been able to do that. They've also not been able to lease the, the community facilities at, at, at Cormac Park, which, you know, in its in its own right impacts on, on, on grassroots football. But the, the reality is, I think probably now, more than ever before, the club and the trust are working so closely together on, on, on a range of projects. And I think, you know, we are a, we are indeed a, a, a powerful force for good um, across the community. We've, see, we, we've demonstrated that particularly during the course of the, of the lockdown. The ability of the club, the trust and even the Red Army together, you know, we can drive key initiatives, whether that's around mental health, whether that's around well-being or education. We've seen the success of those. And we are so much more than just, you know, 90 minutes of football on a Saturday. Some of the programs that the, 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 that the trust run are absolutely essential to this socio-economic fabric of the, of the northeast of Scotland. So it's absolutely imperative that the, the trust is in a position to continue with all of these programs. And I think, you know, touching, touching people's lives in the way that we do, if we can't do that, it's going to be absolutely devastating. You know, we, we don't want to reduce the, 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 the extent and the, and the scale of, of the activities that are carried out. So, you know, hopefully that gives a sense of, you know, where we're at. And, and we, we've got to make sure that the trust is in the best possible position to, to continue to do that. Yeah, Mal, yeah. just, just, just to yeah. jump in on that too. And that's yeah. very well said, Rob, is that we want to be, and we are at the heart of our community. If the club has significantly reduced income, which we will this year, right? We typically do 16 million a year. This current season we're in, we'll do 10 million, you know? So the bottom line is, is that if the club's income is, uh, is hit and we are also support, significantly support through the marketing and sales, et cetera, what goes on at the trust and the trust income is hit as well, right? 
then that's going to impact upon the tens of thousands of people that engage with the trust that we do in the community each year. Who's going to pick that up? Who's going to pick that up in the community? You know, but listen, we, as, 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 as Rob and I said before we came on this, we're going to do our utmost to get through this. I'm a kind of um, all action, cups half full type of guy. We'll get through this, but it's a major challenge but that's what we face with the reduction in income is looking at the uh, our ability to continue to invest as a club and as a community trust in our community. Okay, Dave, you say we're going to get through this, but I mean, how are we going to close the funding gap? Well, um, we're going to continue to work extremely hard related to working with um, the, uh, the the SFA, SPFL, and Scottish government and local um, or, or, or local MPs, MSPs, we're going to work extremely hard to really get the message across that we need a plan to get a safe plan to get people back to Pataudry. And listen, uh, if that means it's a thousand people to two to three thousand people, and then we are looking at full crowds for next season. You know, with the vaccine being around the corner, let's have a plan. That plan can change because we need to show some real, not just hope or desperate hope. We need to show some tangible um, hope that there's a plan there for getting back to this. We will have to work really hard because, as Rob said, Scottish football, right, will rely on income coming for season tickets for 21-22, just around the corner from March. And, um, you know, I, I, our fans have been phenomenal in buying season tickets and, um, and, 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 and being support of the club. But we can't budget for 8,000 season tickets to be sold next season if we can't get the government to work with us to get some sort of plan to give hope to fans, real hope, we'll be back to full crowds for next season. And I think that's, that's the time mile uh, next March, April, May will be the time where Scottish club or Scottish football, because most significant part of income comes from season tickets, is going to be under real stress and duress. But look, um, I'm confident that we will continue to push and be a voice in Scottish football for, um, for bringing fans back and that we'll get there. But it can't just be Aberdeen. It's got to be the rest of Scottish football that steps up and puts their head above the parapet and has a voice too. Rob, just a final one for you. Your commercial hat on. I mean, what has been done to increase revenue streams? You know, revenue streams that are open at the moment. Um, you know, how, how are we making money and what else can the fans do to help? As I said earlier, Mel, you know, we, we obviously converted our traditional match day sponsorship inventory more into a, into a digital format, and that's been well received. We're pushing our buy official appointment program really hard at the moment, and that's growing nicely. You know, that's not contingent on fans being in the stadium, so that's helpful in some ways. We've obviously made the investment significantly in, in, in red TV, and that's helped to drive pay-per-view sales, added value for season ticket holders. I'd use the opportunity to implore fans not to use the illegal streams that are out there. They seem to be fewer and fewer um, that, that, that are out there. But we also ask, you know, don't, don't go to premises where, you know, the games are being shown illegally. That, that's effectively stealing from the club. It's, it's really damaging to the club. And we would really ask people, you know, to, to subscribe to Red TV, make, take advantage of pay-per-view when they can. I think that's a, a really important point to, to get across. And I think... Last but not least, you know, if COVID wasn't enough to deal with, we had the small matter of a, a fairly significant flood um, down at the bottom end of Pataudry Street. And um, a number of the club offices, and in particular the club shop, was, was badly damaged. Um, fortunately, being able to get through the, 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 the nitty gritty of, a, of a, an insurance claim. And the shop is now back up and running, opened last week. I'd urge fans to come down, um, come and find some fantastic Christmas goodies. Um, I was in the shop just the other day. It's looking absolutely terrific. It's a really positive and engaging shopping experience with some new technology in there now as well. 
um, and obviously the new the new home and away strip as well. So we encourage fans, you know, c come on down. You know, don't 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 be strangers to to Pataudry, even if you can't be there on a match day. You know, Jason and his team are, are certainly looking to welcome folk back into the club shop as well. Okay, thanks, Rob. Dave, I'll give you the final word. Maybe just sum up where we are, where we're at. Well, I look upon it from a community standpoint, you know, and um, and obviously, obviously I haven't been in Aberdeen since uh, I think it was the 13th of March when we were supposed to play Motherwell and I flew back the next day. But as, as Rob, you guys well know, we're on Zooms all day, every day, driving the club. Um, for me, the message is this, is that I, without patronising the fans, because we're fans ourselves, is the fans have been unbelievable, not just in terms of, which is important, stepping up on our DNA and realising that every penny we bring in as a club is going to investment in the right things, particularly the football investment. And, um, you know, we, we just, um, we just um, have been heartened, not by the financial impact, but also by the encouragement we've had, not just on social media, but people contacting the club directly about getting through this. I've talked to many people, you know, at uh, the City Council, Aberdeenshire, et cetera, the last two, three months, because listen, everybody's going through this, right? And um, and the the I would just say that the, the city and the shire is falling back in love with the football club because they're seeing us at the heart of the community. That hashtag still standing free campaign was unbelievable. And it came from the heart and it was, we were busy all day, every day, 20,000 calls get to 16,000 people delivering food from Maastricht to Macduff. And um, with this winter coming in and with the, um, it was, was still um, dealing with this pandemic, you know, as I said, we'll put that kind of gang back together again. So my eternal thanks are to the people of Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire um, for supporting our club. It's not my club, it's not our club, me and Rob and a board and the management team, it's our club. We've got a dedicated staff that we care about. We've got a fantastic group of fans and corporates, good, good group of people. And we've got um, a community trust that's the envy of clubs all across Europe. So my mess message is one that the cup's half full and that um, for those that are willing and able, because we're all some people are going through tough times, then any support of initiatives like Aber DNA um, will benefit our club. Dave, Rob, some challenges ahead, but we, we absolutely thank you for your time today, and we really appreciate all the effort you're putting in. Thanks, Mal. Thanks, Mal.